In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, everybody. Sorry it's been a little while, but we're back with Season 2 for the series on Orthodoxy. And we're going to start with the bodiless powers, both good and evil. Just a couple things to clear up before we begin. First off, bodiless means not having physical bodies like humans and animals. They do have some kind of body, or at least some kind of form, but it's entirely unlike our physical bodies. It's purely spiritual. This is why they can take possession of human beings, or animals, or other things. Additionally, the ranks of the bodiless powers are not different species. Even though the descriptions of the different ranks can vary dramatically, their difference is their office, not their species. The best way to think about this is like the different military uniforms. When you're in the military, you have a different uniform based on your rank. I like this comparison especially because the heavenly host refers to the armies of heaven. To begin, we'll start with the good guys, also called the heavenly host or God's divine counsel. They're called the heavenly host because spiritual powers were associated with the stars in the sky. It's not that they believed the stars were the actual beings, just representative of them. That there was a connection between the stars in the sky and the spiritual beings in heaven. Also, because of the multitude of the stars in the sky, they didn't have light pollution back then, so they could see a lot more stars than we do. So they figured the amount of stars in the sky must be amount to the number of bodiless powers in heaven. Okay, so the good bodiless powers, or angels are traditionally divided into nine ranks. The standard source for this is on the celestial hierarchy by Pseudo-Saint Dionysius the Areopagite. There were several works written in the late 5th, early 6th centuries that were supposedly written by Saint Dionysius the Areopagite, mentioned in Acts. They weren't, they were written too late, but they were ascribed to him and they were very influential. And this was one of them. The traditional nine ranks we get from this work. At the top, we have the seraphim, then the cherubim, the thrones, or ophanim, the dominions, the virtues, also translated mites or powers. Then we have the powers, also translated as authorities, principalities, also translated rulers, then the archangels, and then the angels. All nine ranks are mentioned in the Anaphora at the Divine Liturgy of St. Basil the Great. We'll begin with the Seraphim. Singular Seraph, plural Seraphim, or Seraphs. They appear in Isaiah chapter 6, and they stand about the throne of the Lord. So they're incredibly close to God, we will stand right next to his throne. It comes from the Hebrew word Sarap, which literally means to burn. The literal translation of seraphim is venomous snakes. It's translated this way in Numbers chapter 21 and in other places. This is the only time that it's left untranslated. The burning part of it refers to the venom when a snake bites you. When a snake bites you with its venom, it burns, it hurts. There were parallel creatures in Egyptian mythology. They guarded the thrones of the gods. They also decorated the thrones of the pharaohs. And if you see those pharaonic headdresses with the cobra on them, that's a representative of a seraph. So, although the name would seem to imply a serpentine body, this is usually not depicted in orthodox iconography. In fact, I would dare to say never. I've never seen it depicted this way in Orthodox iconography. But even in the text, these serpents have six wings. And it says with two they cover their face, two their body, and then with two with they fly. But they also have, like, hands. Well, real snakes don't have hands, so this is our indication that these are not regular snakes. These are spiritual beings. Because of this, in Orthodox iconography, 
the serpentine part is left out, and instead the burning aspect of the etymology is emphasized. They have a fiery, glowing appearance. In the text, one of the seraphs takes a burning coal and places it to Isaiah's mouth. The burning coal purifies his sins. This imagery is used in our pre-communion prayers. Our next rank is the cherubim, singular cherub. And these are seen throughout the Bible. Their most notable appearance is in Ezekiel chapters 1 and 10. They transport God's throne in Ezekiel's vision. They're described as having four wings and also four faces. A man, a lion, an ox, and an eagle. These four faces have been be adopted as symbols of the four evangelists. Man for Matthew, lion for Mark, ox for Luke, and eagle for John. These winged beasts were also seen as guardians of the thrones of gods in mythologies throughout the area, including in Babylonian and Canaanite mythology. The cherubim are also often identified with the winged beasts in Revelation, though there they have six wings and only one face. So instead of each being having four faces, there's one being with the face of a man, one with the face of a lion, etc. The fact that their appearances vary slightly between the visions should let us know that we shouldn't put too much emphasis on these little details, and that what we're looking at is a higher spiritual reality, not biology. Although the tetramorph form does appear in Orthodox iconography, they're depicted in other ways as well. Oh, by the way, a tetramorph is just a fancy Greek word for four shapes, referring to the four different heads. Often, the many-eyed aspect of the cherubim is emphasized. You can see on the icon on the slide in the bottom that a cherub in the middle, protecting the entrance to the Garden of Eden, has eyes all over its wings. I've also seen the cherubim depicted in Orthodox iconography as the many-eyed wheels in the same vision of Ezekiel. Our next rank is the thrones, or Ophanim, seen in Ezekiel 1 and 10, and also mentioned in Colossians 1 16. The Greek word throni means thrones, and then the Hebrew Ophanim literally means wheels. The many eyed wheels transport the throne of God alongside the cherubim in Ezekiel's vision. In Greek, these Wheel beings are called thrones because they're relation to God's throne. And as mentioned on the last slide, even though they're sometimes called cherubim, they are depicted in Orthodox iconography. You can see here on this icon of Christ enthroned, in the four corners, one of the four living beings, faces of cherubim, th is thrown surrounded by the six-winged seraphim. Then you'll notice under his feet, winged circles. Those will be the thrones. Now for the next several ranks, we don't have a lot of information on them. The first would be the dominions. These are mentioned in Ephesians 121 and Colossians 116. Their job is to regulate the duties of the lower ranks of angels. Below them are the virtues, also translated mites or powers. These are mentioned in Ephesians 1.21 and 1 Peter 3.22. These are the angels which work miracles in the world. Below them are the powers, also translated authorities, mentioned in Ephesians 1.21 and 3.10, Colossians 1.16 and 1 Peter 3.22. These are warrior angels that fight off evil spirits, protecting people from demonic temptation. And then the principalities, also translated rulers. They're mentioned in Ephesians 1.21, 3.10, and Colossians 1.16. 
They're called principalities or rulers because they're princes or rulers of the lower angels. They're also assigned to protect the nations. The second lowest rank would be the archangels. The word archangel appears in 1 Thessalonians 4.16, talking about the archangel's trumpet, and then in Jude verse 9, where it refers to St. Michael as the archangel. In the Divine Liturgy of St. John Chrysostom, it mentions there are thousands of archangels and tens of thousands of angels. Despite this, it is common to refer to the seven archangels. This is taken from Tobit 12.15, where St. Raphael mentioned he's one of the seven angels that stands before the Lord. The seven are associated with the sun, moon, and five planets visible from Earth. So, Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. The traditional seven named archangels are Michael, Ernst and Daniel 10, 13, 12, 1, Jude verse 9, and Revelation 12, 7, 8. Then Gabriel, mentioned in Daniel 8, 16, 9, 21, and Luke 1, 19 through 26. Raphael, mentioned in the book of Tobit, 3, 17, 12, 15. Then Uriel, who is not mentioned in any canonical scripture, but he is mentioned in 2 Ezra 4, 1, and 5, 20. You'll find that in the appendix of Slavonic Bibles, and also in the apocryphal section of the Latin Vulgate and uh, Anglican Bibles. These four are pretty commonly agreed upon as archangels. The other three are a matter of dispute. Most commonly, we have Salafiel, mentioned in 2nd Esdras 5.16, then Jagudiel and Barakiel. Sometimes, Jeremiel, mentioned in 2nd Esdras 4.36, is sometimes included. Other suggested candidates are Raguel, Anael, Jophiel, and Zadkiel. It's worth noting that the only one explicitly called an archangel in the Bible is St. Michael, in Jude verse 9, where he's mentioned as contending with Satan for the body of Moses. But, in Daniel 10.13, he's called one of the chief princes. So that must mean there's more than one chief prince. So if St. Michael's an archangel and a chief prince, if these two terms are synonymous, there must be more than one archangel. Now, one thing I've seen is the difference between an archangel with a capital A and archangel with a lowercase a. This idea that the ones with the lowercase a are this group, the second lowest rank, there's t thousands of them, whereas the capital A archangels are above all the other ranks of angels, not from this choir. They'd be the seven highest angels of all. So they'd be either the seven highest seraphim, with St. Michael being the highest, or even higher than the seraphim. I'm not sure I buy this. For one thing, the only place I really saw it was an unsourced statement on Wikipedia. And also because in the ancient manuscripts, uh, there was no punctuation lowercase letters, or even space between words. So, I think it's reaching here. But, I could be wrong. If you have a better source for me, feel free to link to it. But for now, I don't want to endorse uh, what I can't verify as a factually correct position. Finally, the lowest rank, angels. Just plain angels. The Hebrew word malaakim, and the Greek word Angeli, both literally mean messenger. They're called this because the angels give messages to humans from God. And this is the most common rank of angel found throughout the Bible. This is the most numerous. This is the rank from which our personal guardian angels come. 
one very important thing to clear up. Angels are not dead humans. Humans do not ever become angels. We're completely different categories of beings. I know in the cartoons you see people die and then they go to heaven and they have angel wings and a harp and a halo. Uh, not how it works. We'll talk more about that in a future video. But just know that. that humans don't become angels when they die. So next time you hear someone say after a loved one passes, well, heaven's gained a new angel. You keep quiet and say the correct theology for a different time. People are grieving. What's wrong with you? Alright. Now we move on to the bad guys. Here we're going to find out the true identities of the pagan gods. What I mean? True identities of the pagan gods? Yes. I know today we tend to think of monotheism as believing there's one god that exists and all the others are just fictional characters. Well, that's not how it's presented in the Bible. That's not how Judaism or Christianity saw it. So we're going to find out who those pagan gods really are. The first evil power we're going to discuss is the big baddie. Known by many names and titles. The devil. The serpent. The dragon. Satan or the Satan. Lucifer. Beelzebub. The prince of this world. The strong man. Many names. This is the one that tempted humanity to sin. And as a result, he was cast down from his position into the realm of death. So, the serpent tempted Eve to sin. As a result, he was cast down to crawl on his belly and eat dust. Now, this isn't a fable about how the snake lost its legs. The word for serpent can also mean clever being. So in this case, the most clever spiritual being God created. Crawling on its belly doesn't refer to snakes slithering. It refers to the devil being cast down from heaven down to the abyss. He has to crawl upon the earth now. As for eating dust, they knew snakes don't eat dust. They could see snakes eat animals. The dust refers to humans dying. Remember, you are dust, and unto dust you will return. That's the dust he eats. He is given the dead to rule over. Sometimes, especially in earlier sources, like early church fathers, second temple Jewish literature, there's a distinction between the devil and the Satan. But it's been more common over time to use Satan as a proper name for the devil. So you can see here an example. The traditional translation of Revelation 12:19, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil and Satan, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out out into the earth as angels were cast down with him. Now again, because there was no punctuation in the original text, you could also write that as, and the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, period. And the Satan, now referring to a different being, which deceived the whole world, he was cast out into the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So, notice that the very first title we come across in scripture for this chief evil spirit is the serpent. Wait, where did we talk about serpents earlier? Oh right, the seraphim. So that parallels the angelic rank. The seraphim, the heavenly snakes, and then this evil serpent. But in Ezekiel 28, He's also described as having been a cherub. So was he a seraph or a cherub? It doesn't matter. The point is, there was a high-ranking spiritual being that deceived human beings and was cast out for it. Additionally, in regards to the merging of the devil and the Satan... I think it's worth noting that in the Hebrew book of Job, 
the main adversary is called Satan, which means the adversary. But in the Greek translation of the Old Testament, where you see Satan in Hebrew, you find the devil in the Greek. So, again, this question of whether the devil and the Satan are different beings or the same is confusing goes back quite a ways. So he mentioned the devil as having been either a seraph or a cherub. But you often hear Satan as having been an archangel before his fall. Well, if the two are distinguished, then this makes sense. And in this case, the Satan is identified with the former archangel Samael. We mentioned in Jude verse 9, the archangel Michael is in that verse. It says he contended with Satan over the body of Moses. Well, in the Jewish tradition, including the text about the assumption of Moses, that being St. Michael contended with was Samael. So, if this was Samael falling later, being the Satan, there are two different beings. But again, over time it's become common to merge the two together. And again, regardless of the details, the point is there's a big spiritual baddie out there who seeks our destruction and damnation. That's what's important. Not all these details. Okay, so after that long digression, back to the main point. He was given the dead to rule over, at least for a while. When Christ voluntarily laid down his life, he entered the domain of the strong man and bound him. Entered the strong man's house, bound him, and they opened the doors to paradise. We'll talk more about this in our next video when we cover death in the afterlife. One final thing I need to make clear. Again, we'll get more to this in the next video. Satan, the devil, whatever you want to call him, is not a ruler of hell that torments the damned humans. We'll explain more about that, but all the depictions you see of Satan being a ruler of hell who's in charge of torturing people, not how it works. All right. Now then, besides the big baddie, there are multiple demons and fallen angels. Plenty of evil spirits out there. First example we see comes from Genesis 6-4. There were giants on earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of God came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, the same became mighty men, which were of old, men of renown. Okay, so with regard to giants, people have tried to demythologize this a little and Look at the original Hebrew, talk about Nephilim and what that means. But it means giants. In the retranslation of the Old Testament, made even before the birth of Christ, they translated it as giants. So yes, it's talking about giants. What this was originally interpreted as, including in early church fathers, was that there were angels that saw beautiful women, lusted after them, and uh, impregnated them. And those resulting children were the giants. Now, what you have to remember is in the surrounding areas of Israel, the pagan mythologies would always describe their great heroes and kings as being giants, part human and part god. So what this is doing is slipping it on that head and saying, hey, those gods your great kings were descended from, yeah, they're bad guys. <laughs> also, in, for example, the Sumerian kings list, you'll talk about these demigod beings, these giants, as having gained secret knowledge from the gods and many great technologies. You see that parallel in Genesis with the descendants of Cain inventing all these technologies? So the parallel there is that they learn these from evil demons. So again, those great heroes that the pagans like, they're bad guys, descended from wicked spiritual beings. Now, these giants were wiped out in the flood, but their spirits remained as demons. Now, I just want to point out that as time went on, 
the more fantastic mythological part of the text were de-emphasized again. And the patristic census has pretty much come to be that the sons of God referred to the righteous humans descended from Seth, while the daughters of men were descended from Cain. I do think the two can be reconciled. Because remember, these are bodiless powers, and they can take possession of other beings. So, I think that's how we can reconcile it, that these angels took possession of some of the righteous descendants of Seth, that impregnated the women descended from Cain, and that's what these wicked beings are. But that's just my thinking. I haven't found any source on that, reconciling the two. It's just me thinking out loud here. <laughs> I can understand a quick objection would be, wait, these are bodiless powers, so how could they possibly impregnate human women? But it's not unusual to talk about spiritual powers taking physical form. I remember the story of the life of St. Anthony the Great. The demons would untie his prayer ropes until he began tying the knots in the shape of a cross. And also, because he was so holy and the temptations weren't causing him to sin, the demons took physical form and physically assaulted him. So, there is precedent for the idea of spiritual beings taking on physical form and interacting physically. But again, don't want to get too bogged down on details. There's a bigger theological point to be made, and we'll get to that once I finish all the fun stuff. Now then, the spirits of these giants aren't the only demons or evil spiritual beings. After the flood in the city of Babylon... They start building a giant ziggurat. Well, God didn't like the idea of them trying to build a tower and bring him down to make him do what humans wanted. So this is when he scattered the nations and changed their languages. At this time, each of the nations was assigned a guardian angel. People have guardian angels, so do the nations. What happened was, people began to worship these angels as though they were God. So that's when they fell and became corrupt, because they sought and accepted this. These fallen angels, these demons, these are the true identities of the pagan gods. Again, the position throughout the Bible is not that these other gods don't exist. It's not that there's only one god and all these other gods are just fictional characters. It's these other gods, while they're not gods, they do exist. They are spiritual beings that were assigned to protect the nations and accepted worship from them. Now it's worth noting that the Bible tends not to distinguish between human powers and the spiritual powers behind them. So when this happened, people began worshiping these fallen angels. They gave control over the world to the leader of these angels, to the devil, to Satan. So, this is a subtle point made throughout the Bible. So, Pharaoh, Sennacherib, Nebuchadnezzar, Caesar. The true power behind each of these tyrants is the devil. Part of Christ coming into the world was to free the world from these demonic powers. And we saw this begin with the resurrection, and later it spread and the nation became gradually freed from demonic control. Most famously, the conversion of the Roman Empire into a Christian empire. Now then, I put a question here so I'd remember how many are there. I just thought this was interesting. Apparently, St. John Chrysostom hypothesized that the number of angels that fell is equal to the number of humans that will be saved. Because, again, remember, these angels fell, so they were kicked out of God's divine council, out of the host of heaven. So, human saints take their place. That's not church dogma or even doctrine, it's just something I thought was interesting. Okay, so then, I know we covered a lot of 
weird, confusing, and even contradictory details. But all these fun little details, interesting as they might be to talk about, are less important than the real deep theological truth. That is that there are spiritual beings, both good and evil. And they play a role in our lives, and we need to be aware of it. So, if you're an Orthodox Christian and seek to live a Christian life and avoid demonic influence, you would want to avoid things like psychics or mediums, astrology, Ouija boards, all occult things. Because, at the very best, those things are hokum. Hokum, humbug, nonsense, uh, more colorful words that I can't say. <laughs> Meaning, they're nothing. People are deceiving you. And at worst, they're demonic. So that medium channeling the spirit of your dead loved one, very good chance it's not your dead loved one, it's a demon. Remember, the demons have been around for a long time, so they're going to know your loved ones, they're going to know details. There's actually a um, debate within um, the interpretation of the Witch of Endor episode seen in the Books of Kings, or Books of Samuel, if you use the Hebrew names. When Saul went to the Witch of Endor and she summoned the spirit of Samuel, some fathers think, yeah, God allowed the spirit of Samuel to talk to him. Others say, no, this was a demon she conjured up. <laughs> it wasn't actually Samuel. So again, avoid all things like that. Because again, at best, nonsense, and at worst, demonic. And continue to ask for the intercessions of your guardian angel, your patron saint, the Theotokos, all, and uh, other saints. Because if you have your allies helping you out, you'll have a better chance. And of course, above all else, continue to pray to God and participate in the holy mysteries of the church regularly. If you're vigilant and are working on your salvation, trying to keep the church teachings and you're going to the mysteries regularly, you have a good prayer life, you don't really need to fear the devil or his angels. All right. Thank you for joining me for this season premiere. We'll be getting more episodes out this Lent. I hope you enjoy them. Also, if you want more details, I'm including several links from Father Stephen de Young's whole council blog, which was very influential and helpful in doing this video. Those are excellent articles. Everything he writes is awesome. I highly recommend him. So I'll include those links in the description. You can check those out on your own if you want. All right, then. O oh Lord, now let your servants depart in peace according to your word. For our eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all people, a light to enlighten the Gentiles, and the glory of your people Israel.